The Mountain Lion by Gene Stafford. Chapter 9 In the winter, Molly would go on Saturday morning up to the summit of Garland Peak, where, by chance one day turning over a stone, she had found it red with hibernating ladybugs. No one at the ranch or at school had ever heard of this phenomenon, and the president of the Nature Lore Society, a boy of fifteen, told her it was something that ought to interest the people at the agricultural college. Accordingly, she sent the entomology department thousands of them, packing them into matchboxes and wrapping them carefully in heavy brown paper. She got no acknowledgment at all except for one typed postal card without a signature which notified her that the parcel, it was the eighth, had arrived. She was not at all disheartened and continued weekly to gather the sleeping bugs, sure that an investigation was underway and that in time her name would be mentioned in a monograph in a scientific journal. She went even on the coldest days when the snowdrifts were deep and the pine needles in the glades were ossified with ice. The shapes of the high blue trees were obscured by the snow that encumbered their branches, and they looked like formless ghosts. Sometimes the wind came fiercely down the trackless slopes, blowing sharp pellets into her face. On the upland meadows the sun was blinding, and walking there was difficult, because the crust was thin and the soft piles of snow beneath were deep. Garland Peak had always been her favorite to climb. It was one of the lowest in the first range, lying to the north and west of the ranch. In the summer she went up the face of it, but since this involved scaling three chimneys, she had to change her route when the storms came and was obliged to approach it indirectly, first climbing halfway up a higher peak and then cutting across a mesa, down a gulch and up the opposite bank to the, to the northern base. The ascent was not an easy one at any time of year, but it was worth all the fatigue. From the summit she commanded a view of the entire valley, of the range as far as the eye could see, and of Cuthbert Pass, beyond which, disappearing finally in a gazy blue, were the highest mountains of all, the arrowheads, which seemed as far away as the end of the world. In the summer the mesa below was like a sheet of rusted metal with densely growing Indian paintbrush and there was a part of it where columbines grew at the edge of a stream, in which, down near the gulch where it broadened out just before it joined another stream, there was the largest beaver dam in all the hills, around. In earlier summers, when Winifred or Ralph had gone with her, they had often seen deer grazing among the blue flowers, but she had never seen anything, not so much as a rabbit, when she was alone. She had been here in the fall, when the aspens shone like money among the conifers on all the foothills, and the high fields were dark green with the first shoots of winter wheat. The hay had been up for weeks by then, and the stubble in the meadow was short and even, and had an itchy, barbered look. The highway, a narrow glitter, went between red banks until it vanished midway up Cuthbert at a pyramidal stone called the King's Tower. At that time, through Uncle Claude's field glasses, which she took surreptitiously from his desk, Grandmother Bonnie's eyes each time she did this seemed to follow her. She had been able to see the cattle moving down from the summer range, their white faces bobbing up and down like buoys as they ran. It was hard to see the bodies behind them, for the soil up there was almost as red as their hides. She could clearly see Uncle Claude's place. One day she heard a shot ring out, and she could see Homer running across the yard to a flapping turkey. She knew it was Homer by his black shirt. Another time she saw Mrs. Brotherman moving about in the kitchen garden, and Molly, spying on her, said aloud, Miss Budmanny's at the muskmelons. Until she had found the ladybugs, Molly had gone to the mountain to be undisturbed at her writing. She carried her materials with her in a small knapsack on her back, three notebooks with glossy blue covers, on the inside of which was printed the multiplication table and information about weights and measures, a pocket dictionary, pencils and a pocket knife to sharpen them with, a safety match box full of paper clips and one of rubber bands, and, though she had no use for it, several sheets of carbon paper. She had found an ideal glade for her study. It was very small and surrounded so densely by trees and choke cherry that they were almost like walls, and right in the middle, as if planned for her, was a big, flat rock. The first thing she had written there was a long, humorous ballad called The Fierce Mexican, which she was able to admire for several weeks, rereading it nightly when she was in bed. But she turned upon it finally with such loathing that she tore it up into tiny little pieces and tried to forget it, but she could not. The imperfection of the rhyme of Mexican and Mohican 
stuck to her mind like paste. She had quit writing poetry after that and had simultaneously begun a detective novel called The Mystery of the Portland Vase and a short story about a leper colony. The novel was not successful because it was too short. Furthermore, the reading public would have immediately found her out because the article in the Sunday supplement of the Denver Post, from which she had got the idea, had said that the vase had just been found and had been put under lock and key in the British Museum, about which she knew nothing. But she was well pleased with the short story and thought of submitting it to the Scholastic magazine. The hero was a man named Lord Garnsborough, who had so wasted away that all that was left of him was one tooth. He and his close friend, Lawnfall Hottentot, who was all gone but the lobe of his right ear, traveled about together in a glass cage, visiting people in worse conditions than they. An especially pitiful case was that of Malachi Strattonbottle, who had nothing left but a small spit curl of oleaginous hair. Now in the winter she wrote in her bedroom in the evenings and on Sundays, and she kept a meticulously detailed account in a separate notebook of what she had seen on her ladybug trips. The ladybug place was very near her studio, and she always looked in. Completely covered in snow, it was as if it lay under dust sheets waiting her return in the spring. In some ways, the view from Cuthbert was more exciting at this season than at any other. On a clear day, it was possible to see the men on the ricks in the pastures. Pitching down feed to the herd, which appeared to be hundreds of small red blocks on the glaring snow, as small as her ladybugs. The caribou was frozen solid, and all the trees on either side of it were bare. Molly loved the snow. When she had seen her first snowfall, she pretended to have a sore throat, and did not go to school that day but stayed in bed, watching the snow flurry in imperfect circles over the poplar trees. Both Ralph and Uncle Claude thought Molly's enterprise was absurd, and they said they imagined her box of boxes of ladybugs had given rise to all sorts of jokes in the laboratory. Uncle Claude said she called to mind a cranky friend of Grandpa's who had shot magpies for three weeks and had tried to sell the feathers to a veteran's hospital to use for burning out the sick room smells. She did not care a red cent for the opinion of either one of them on this or on any other subject. She rarely talked to them, but now and again if she particularly did not want to talk to Mrs. Brotherman about plants... She was rather outgrowing her interest in them as a result of Mrs. Brotherman's preoccupation this winter with snake root, which Molly found singularly unattractive. And if she had finished a book and did not want to start another, she would play double Canfield with one of them or casino with both. They were so stupid and slow-witted that there was no sport in playing with them, but it was fairly fun to watch them make mistakes. It seemed to Molly when she was alone in the mountains that she had been by herself for years now, really ever since Grandpa had died. It was as if Ralph and her mother and sisters were no blood kin to her at all, as if nobody ever had been except her father and Grandpa Kenyon, who was really only what you called a connection. She was entirely solitary at school, which she disliked this year. She disliked the harsh mountain voices of the children and the teachers and the smell of winter clothes, and she hated riding eye-opener over the river and then two miles into town every morning when the sun was just barely up and then back in the late afternoon when it was already going down, and the light on the snow-covered meadows was blue. The children in her grade were so backward that she had to be given extra work to occupy her, and she made notebooks of advertisements clipped from magazines showing different types of houses, landscapes, and occupations. The motto for the occupations notebook was, Give us, oh give us, the man who sings at his work. When she was not unhappy, she was bored. The only things that really gave her pleasure were the ladybugs, her writing, and her plans for a horrible life for Ralph. She became so obsessed with the idea that he would turn into Grandfather Bonnie that she almost believed that he looked like him already, and on the flyleaf of her diary she drew a farcical facsimile of the portrait under which she wrote, Ralph Bonnie Jr. Every Saturday she took her brownie along. She did not have much luck with photography, and in her pictures the sky took up more space than anything else and trees and buildings tended to be diagonal. But she hoped that she would one day see Goldilocks and could take her picture. Uncle Claude and Ralph, timid of the snowy slopes, typical, typical, exulted her scornful heart, had left off their hunt and said they would find her in the spring. But just as always before, she never saw a living thing when she was alone. And then, the very day they came with her, they caught sight of the mountain lion. On the Saturday before Christmas, Uncle Claude decided that they must have a Christmas tree. 
They said they would go to Garland with Molly and on the way down would cut a big fir and they took a sled along, leaving it at the foot. There had been a big snowfall on Thursday and there had been no thaw. The sun was warm on the slopes and mesas and brilliant in the branches of the evergreens, but the air was cold and the wind was raw in the unprotected clearings. Uncle Claude said it might drop to twenty below that night. They had got the ladybugs. Uncle Claude scraped them up with his hunting knife, to Molly's exasperation, for she used a spatula, which seemed more humane and also more scientific, and had started down. Uncle Claude was the first to get to the opposite bank of the gulch, and just as Ralph and Molly began the ascent, he turned around and motioned them to come quietly. It was an easy climb, and the path was deep in snow, so that they made no sound. Once Molly broke off an ice-covered twig on a chokecherry bush, but the noise was slight. Their uncle stood absolutely still, watching something. He had moved into the cover of a small, deformed scrub oak laden with snow, and he beckoned them to join him. They stepped carefully in his boot prints, not seeing yet what he did. Then, when they were beside him, he pointed to the east side of the mesa, and there they saw the mountain lion standing still with her head up, facing them, her long tail twitching. She was honey-colored all over, save for her face, which was darker, a sort of yellow-brown. They had a perfect view of her for the mesa. There was bare of anything, and the sun illuminated her so clearly that it was as if they saw her close up. She allowed them to look at her for only a few seconds, and then she bounded across the place where the columbines grew in summer and disappeared among the trees. Her flight was lovely. Her wasteless grace and speed did not make Molly think immediately of her fear, but of her power. When you saw a running deer, you were conscious only of its instinct to flee danger. The lion had sensed peril, and yet they, the watchers, sensed peril in her. Under her tawny hide, in the way her tail had moved against the glint of the snow, in the way she streaked across the flat land. Molly shivered to think she might now have climbed a tree like a tame cat, and might be sitting there observing them with large green eyes. God damn, said Uncle Claude. This would be the day we'd see her when we never brought our guns. His face in the snow glare did not show so much disappointment as anger, as if he really hated the mountain lion and wanted to kill her for that reason and not for the sport of it. Ralph did not say a word, but continued to look at the place where she had been, smiling a secret smile. She was afraid and thought she could never come here again. The lion grew to huge proportions in her reflection. She imagined its claws, its teeth, the way it would hiss. She remembered a lioness at the zoo at Balboa Park who had stopped in her prowling now and then to lift her lips and grumble deeply. She had not reminded Molly at all of a cat, with those heavy dewlaps and puppy-like paws, and it seemed incredible to her that their pansy-faced budge belonged to the same species, though Leah and Rachel and Aunt Kathleen kept insisting that she see the close resemblance. Afterward, Molly often had a dream that she was being chased mile after mile through the streets of San Diego by the lioness who almost overtook her at every mailbox. When they started down, she twice looked back over her shoulder and she kept close to Ralph. When they got home, she did not wait to help take the tree off the sled, but went straight into the house, feeling unsafe until then. Mrs. Brotherman was in the living room, putting up the holly wreaths, and when Molly came in to warm her hands at the fire, she said, a friend just sent me a box of delicious apples, and I do think they're quite the best I ever tasted. Let me finish this one wreath, and then we'll go upstairs and have one. Molly looked at the scar on her hand, and then she thought again of the golden cat, and her fear left. In its place there came a soft, inexplic inexplicable sadness. On the way down, her arm had once brushed against her brother's, and remembering this, she felt weak. The warmth of Mrs. Brotherman's sitting room and the smell of the apples, the sight of the widow watering a pot of begonia with a small sprinkling can, the bright winter sunlight through the dimity curtains, made Molly even sadder. She was full of wishes. She wished that she had yellow hair like Leah's and Rachel's and the lion's. She wished she could go to London and become a famous writer. She wished she did not have to wear glasses. She wished she were only four feet five. Mrs. Brotherman, blowing up the fire with a pair of small red bellows, said, I'm always sad at Christmas here, although your uncle does everything he can to make it a happy season. The statement must have come at the end of a long string of thoughts, but in that even toneless voice there was no clue to their nature, whether Christmas made her conscious of her widowhood, or whether she longed to be a child, or longed to be in Salem. Molly was embarrassed and quickly said, Oh, I forgot to tell you, we saw Goldilocks. 
Mrs. Brotherman sat on a bench before the fire, clutching her hands together in her lap. And even though Molly could only see her profile, she saw fear arrive in the twi twilight face and remain there. Then turning, she said, There's nothing here but danger, and there never has been, but this is the worst yet. I had hoped Mr. Canyon had been mistaken. Oh, a mountain lion isn't dangerous, said Molly, courageous in the presence of this adult cowardice. They're just as afraid of people as deer are. Perhaps, but I will feel safer when it is dead. I hope you will not go back there. If the men must go, they must, but it's not right for a girl to be alone in the mountains with a lion loose. Molly threw her apple core into the fire and heard it hiss briefly. She too would not feel safe until the beautiful animal was dead. She would never be unafraid at Garland again because in the back of her mind she would always know that the big cat might be watching her from the crotch of a tree or from behind a rock. She left the sitting room and went to her bedroom where she wrapped up the t last of the ladybugs she would ever send. She could not keep her mind on anything. It kept darting around like a darning needle and she did not know what was the matter with her. If only she had yellow hair, she thought, she would be an entirely different kind of person. She would not be cross all the time. And at the very thought of her crossness, she began to grow very angry, and it became clear to her that Ralph and Uncle Claude had gone with her today knowing they would see Goldilocks, just in order to spoil her ladybug project. They had known that she never saw any wild animals when she was alone, and they had come today deliberately so that everything would be ruined. There had been absolutely no reason for them not just to stay at the foot and cut down their idiotic Christmas tree. She personally would have nothing to do with the tree as she thought the whole idea of it was too sentimental for words. In fact, she thought Christmas itself was a bourgeois, and she had never got anything she wanted but just things like a patent leather hat box or yarn, yarn flowers that you were supposed to pin on your coat, as if you ever would. There was going to be a piece of mistletoe hung in the door between the dining room and the living room, and the thought of it gave her goose flesh, because she remembered once in Covina Mr. Follinsby had kissed Miss Runyon, and Miss Runyon had squealed and said, Of all things, aren't you the foxy grandpa? And besides that, Uncle Claude had bought a lot of grain alcohol and rock gut. Rock gut. People ought to be put in jail for using words like that. And kept saying that they would all get Stinko, and then I'm going to trim every jack man of you at Red Dog. It was not hard to imagine. They would all pile up to the gallery and clank their silver dollars together, acting as if they were in a movie. And Winifred was coming home. She was coming on the evening train tonight, in fact, and there was no doubt at all that she had acquired insufferable airs. Molly knew because she had got a letter from her in which she sounded exactly like Leah and Rachel. My sorority sisters are griped because I am the only pledge who has already got dated up for the junior prom. Molly had replied, Personally, I have never heard of a junior prom. Possibly you are thinking of promenade. I thought you went to college to study Cicero's essays, and I must say, Winifred, that you do not sound as if you were making much effort to be an outstanding Bablu. It had been a severe measure, but one thing no one could ever say about Molly Fawcett was that she was wishy-washy. Decisively, she got out her diary and added Winifred's name to the list of un unforgivables, and then, because he had wrecked the ladybug business, she also put down Claude Clubfoot, Kenyon. Recent sh recently, she had learned that Claude meant lame, and she had decided to put a new character in the story about the leper colony called Claude Binks, who only had one toenail left. She lit the incense in the gilt incense Buddha burner, which she had brought from Covina, and very briefly prayed that the mountain lion would either clear out of the hills or would step into a skunk trap. She hoped neither Ralph nor Uncle Claude would get her. Molly had not yet decided whether she would be a Catholic or a Buddhist, but she had narrowed the choice down to these two as she certainly had no intention of being either a Presbyterian or a Christian scientist. Magdalene had told her about the Holy Rollers, but Molly did not think they were her style. Her final decision depended on what would make Mr. Fallens be the maddest, and now she sat down at the table and wrote him a letter frankly asking him. She also wrote a letter to President Hoover and one to Henry Ford. They were identical and read, Dear Gentlemen, I have been apprised of your outstanding munificence with regard to helping people along the highway of life, and so I wonder if you have any typewriters that you don't need. I am very needful of one myself, and if you could see your way clear to sending me one, I will be very grateful. 
I think what you have done for other people is wonderful, and I hope it will come to pass that I will have first-hand knowledge anent this. Respectful yours, Molly Fawcett. P.S. There is no railway express here, so you will have to send it by freight. These were quite useless, she knew. She had already asked ten other people of lesser importance, including Dr. Haskell, and had got only one reply, except for a comic postal from the doctor on which he wrote, If at first you don't succeed, try, try again, and so she had. And that was from Spencer Penrose's secretary, saying that Mr. Penrose was out of town, was, in fact, in India, but would attend to her letter when he got back. Of course, the Blatherskite never did, and he had been in Colorado Springs for two months now, and she had not heard a word from him. Furthermore, she had read in the Denver Post that he had bought an elephant to bring back to the Broadmoor. What for? thought Molly. Which seemed really unfair, considering how badly she needed a typewriter and how much cheaper they were than elephants. She sealed her letters and then stood in front of the mirror with her teeth sticking out. Clara? Clara? she said. Then, without leaving the bureau, but leaning on one elbow, she reached for her diary and her pencil, and to the list of unforgivables she added her own name. She burst into tears and cried until she was hungry, and all the time she cried she watched herself in the mirror, getting uglier and uglier, until she looked like an Airedale. Easter came late that year. The pasque flowers were already paling on the mesas, and the cactus was in bloom smelling like melons. This time of year was full of wonders. Even the howling of the coyotes had a queer charm for Ralph, and after they had ceased, the meadow lark sang freshly for an hour or so. The light lying on the meadows just at dawn and then again just before dark was a singular ominous yellow, giving to trees and to animals a submarine remoteness and ambiguity of outline. But then, in the broad light, and then when the night came, the shapes were separated. There was always a haze on the far mountains, and sometimes it bedimmed Garland Peak. The evenings were cool and light. Through the open windows came the smell of the first new leaves of the hop vines and the upturned dirt of the flower garden. There were clear nocturnal sounds from the direction of the caribou, where the negroes from the mines fished in the dusk, and then when night came built fires on the river bank to fry their trout and to drink whiskey and sing spirituals amongst the weeping willow trees. Ralph dreamed of the mountain lion and thought, Oh, if I don't get her, I will die. He saw himself standing where they had stood before Christmas, taking perfect aim, shooting her through her proud head with its wary eyes, and then running across the mesa to stroke her soft, saffron flanks and paws. Ralph had always loved cats, and when Budge had died this spring of old age, he had been wretched for days, mourning the lost purr and the quiet feet. He would not skin the mountain lion, he decided, if he got her, but would have her stuffed and keep her in his room all his life. If he had to go to college, he would take her along with him. He wished that Uncle Claude were not so keen as he, for he felt somehow that he had more right to Goldilocks. He wanted her because he loved her, but Uncle Claude wanted her only because she was something rare. Besides, Uncle Claude would be here forever and could get another, but this was Ralph's last chance. Sometimes, indeed, he forgot that he was not her only hunter, and at such times he seemed to sink into a golden bath of joy. They saw the mountain lion on Easter Sunday. This time she was beside the stream, nearer the gulch than the place where, they, where she had vanished before, close to the beaver dam. They had only a momentary glimpse of her, and then she leaped away and was out of sight before they could even raise their rifles. They ran to the place where she had been and found that she had left her food, too startled by their voices to carry it off. A half-eaten woodchuck lay beside a tree stump. Its entrails chewed, but its silly head intact and twisted to a sheepish angle. It had been mauled and slobbered on, and its grizzled hair was clotted. There was blood on some of the chips of wood left by the beavers when they had gnawed down the tree. Uncle Claude, frustrated, angry, moved around the stump, examining everything as if he expected to find a clue which would lead him to her den. Sighing, he said, blast the yellow bitch. And Ralph, feeling himself on the verge of tears, said desolately, What do we do now? Go home, I reckon, said Uncle Claude, but by damn, I'm going to get me my cat yet. Ralph kept the edge out of his voice, but his heart was rapid. He said, You mean, I'm going to get me my cat. Uncle Claude glanced sidelong at him, but said nothing, and they started down the creek bank. 
The creek was swollen from the thaws, and there were places where the water sprayed like a geyser in the hollows between the rocks. Between two boulders at a widening, Ralph saw the points of a set of antlers sticking up out of the water, and he waded in, not bothering to take off his shoes. But what he found was not just one set of antlers. He found the skulls of two deer with horns so tightly interlocked that he could not get them apart. They were wedged in between the rocks, and he had trouble getting them loose. The water was cold and insistently flicked up his pants legs, and once he lost his footing and slipped on a rock. When he came out with his trophy, he found Uncle Claude sitting on a patch of grass, smoking, watching Ralph without the least interest. "'What do you do with them now that you got them?' he said. Ralph did not immediately answer, but tried again to get the horns apart. His heart constricted when he conjured up what must have taken place, the two bucks charging one another, and then by lunatic accident before joining as one, toppling into the water to drown, still struggling to get free. But it was not so much the violence of this wilderness death that made him quiver. It was his uncle's indifference. The same indifference he had seen when he looked at the sick bull. His passion for Goldilocks went over him like an ocean wave, for he was determined that she, at least, would be killed not out of this cold calm of Uncle Claude's, but out of his own love for her golden hide. Uncle Claude repeated, What will you do with them? Why, I'll take them to Magdalene as a present, he said. Or, no, I'll take them to Molly. Uncle Claude laughed shortly. You'd better take Molly a box of candy to sweeten her disposition. What's the matter with that kid, anyway? Ralph took in his breath sharply. Search me, he said. Later, when he took the antlers up to Molly's room, he found her lying on her bed with the counterpane over her head. She pulled it down and stared at his present with terrible woe, but without scorn. They exchanged at last, after these months, a look of understanding. And Molly said, Thanks, Ralph. I'll shoot them with my brownie. Finally, school was over. On the night of commencement, he sat in the hot auditorium where the June bugs bumbled foolishly against the window screens, and the teacher sat among the baskets of gladioli and the potted rubber plants on the stage, listening to a boy in glasses deliver the valedictory. His voice broke twice, rising to a plaintive scream, once on the word emperor and once on romance. He used phrases like elegiac cadences and poetic counterpoint, and he said that Virgil had been born to the purple of classic literature. When he came to the end, he begged permission to finish with the lines of a devotee of Roman literature more mellifluous than myself, id est Alfred Lord Tennyson, and he recited Freder Ave Atque Vale. Ralph immediately saw the portrait of Grandfather Bonnie, and he was clutched by terror at the shortness of the time. He felt that his mother and sisters, who were now in Venice, were speeding, were about to overtake him, and there was no time to lose, for he must have Goldilocks before they came. He looked for Molly, who was to receive an eighth-grade diploma. She was sitting three rows away from him, and when the boy had finished, she turned round and looked directly at her brother, puffing out her cheeks to look like a fat person. The day after that, they took the car, Ralph, Winifred, and Molly. Winifred drove, and they went as far up Garland as the red road went. She and Molly climbed the face, but Ralph could not manage the chimneys with his gun and went around the other way. Uncle Claude had taken a mare to stud, and he had told them that when he got through, he would come looking for them in the hills, and he would pack some food along so that they could cook out. Ralph met them at the stream. Red dust had come off on their hands when they climbed the chimneys, and they washed it off in the cold water, letting the fool's gold run through their fingers. All three of them lay down, crushing harebells, and looked straight upward. A chicken hawk lazily banked and coasted across the sky, behind them in the forest. The chipmunks and the blue jays sent up their absent-minded racket against the wind, which was always present in the pine trees like a voice. Hearing it, Ralph wished he were at the foot of a tree in the strange and smoky shade, and were lying on the pinkish-brown pine needles. But the high, hot sun was too excellent to leave. Winifred held her arm over her eyes, and Ralph noticed the tiny golden hairs on her wrists and on the back of her hands. She was not going back to college next year. She was going to marry John Fulbright on the 1st of July, and they were going to the eastern part of the state to start a truck farm. Mrs. Brotherman, too, was leaving the barquet now that her daughter was grown. She was going back to Salem. Ralph was sure that the odor of apples would cling to her rooms. He thought how lonely his uncle would be next winter and was sorry for him. The winter was an idle time for him, and in this year Ralph had seen that idleness aged him. 
He did little of the feeding himself, because some years before he had ridden into town without chaps, had been delayed, and coming back after the sun had gone down, and when the thermometer registered twenty-five below, he had frozen both his legs, and he was afraid thereafter of freezing them again. He hunted a little, emptied his traps, and took care of his beaver and ermine hides, gave a hand with the milking, and gathered the eggs for Magdalen. The rest of the time he spent at his desk, studying the histories of his bulls and writing letters on lined paper with an indelible pencil to his foreman on the other ranches, playing a kind of solitaire called Once in a Blue Moon, and reading books like The Count of Monte Cristo, Graustark, and Beau Ideal. Ralph pitied him so much at this moment that he almost wished Uncle Claude would get Goldilocks, but his generosity was brief-lived. Where was she now? How wonderful she must be in this hot sun. The smoke from Winifred's cigarette went straight up and then opened out into a horn like a blue lily. Ralph thought somnolently, the lilies of the field are numbered. He saw in his mind's eye that wide, bare plateau at the glacier where the yellow orchids grew. Now, years after their expedition there, he thought how curious it was that he and Molly had not been tempted to eat the strawberry snow, for it had looked as delicious as sherbet. That was the day his friendship with Uncle Claude had begun, and the day on which he had abandoned Molly. It had begun in a look of recognition. He fell into a lazy meditation. He wondered if Montreux, where the travelers were going next, was similar to this, and if the Alps were as tall as the Rocky Mountains. He wondered if their hotel would be like the Brown Palace. He pretended that he lay on the thick carpet in the center of the lobby looking up at the dome as if it were a motion picture screen. He saw ladies in taffeta dresses and small velvet tooks, mitts, and pointed satin slippers. Saw the gambling tables where the croupiers used heavy shovels because the money was all in gold bricks. In those days the ladies had bathed in champagne and gold-plated tubs. Everything that presented itself to him was gold, the bark on the palm trees in Covina, the whiskey in the glass that Grandpa had left when he went upstairs to die, lay his hair above the tall chrysanthemums, the clasps on Grandfather Bonnie's books. He did not will any of these images, but they came in a stately promenade. There was a small gold brooch of two clasped hands in his mother's button box, and in the same box was a tarnished heart-shaped locket on a fine chain. He remembered Jesus' halo on the cards given out at Sunday school, the gilt star of Bethlehem on the Christmas tree, his tenderfoot pin. Once they heard a freight train going out, and once, from somewhere miles away, a blast of dynamite. Contented as he was with this present time, he was idly trying to think what it was reminded him of, and when, at last, opening his eyes, he saw the chicken hawk again. He remembered the airplane those long years ago, when he and Molly had lain on the Lippia lawn, waiting for Uncle Claude to come and bury Grandpa. He said, Molly, do you remember the airplane that day of Grandpa Kenyon's funeral? His voice sounded submerged and hesitant to him, and he found he was trembling for her answer. She paused a long time, and then, leaning across Winifred, she looked straight at him and said, All I remember in the whole wild world is that I hate you and I hope you will get fat. Winifred laughed. You've got the worst temper in the county. I beg to differ, said Molly. It is the worst in the state, in the United States, in North America, in the Western Hemisphere, in the world, in the universe. She said this rapidly, letting her voice rise powerfully. All right, be a bad sport, said Ralph wearily, and closed his eyes again. You'd be a bad sport, too, she said to Winifred, if you knew what he said to me. Molly, he cried and sat up straight. What did he say? asked Winifred, amused. Molly, if you tell, I'll... You'll what? She looked at him coldly. Then she stretched out her long, thin arm and pointed in the direction of Cuthbert Pass and said, If we had the field glasses, we could see the tunnel from here. What did Ralph say to you, Molly? insisted Winifred. Oh, I don't intend to tell you, Winifred Brotherman. By the by, don't you think Ralph is getting fat? He jumped to his feet and picked up his gun. I'm going now, he said tightly. What for? Molly smiled at him teasingly, twirling a harebell between her fingers. Cat fur to make kitten breeches, he snapped, and then was annoyed with himself for using the childhood joke. That is a very good pun, I'm sorry to say, said Molly. I surely don't think you knew as you were making it, as I have never known anyone more unfurnished in the upper story. He did not know what she was talking about. He did not understand the pun he had made. 
Striding through the harebells, he enjoyed the feeling of crushing the blue flowers under his feet. Winifred called after him, good luck, but he did not turn back. He could not have any luck, for even if he saw Goldilocks, he couldn't shoot until Uncle Claude came. He went downstream toward the beaver dam, making too much noise at first in his irritation with Molly, and then treading lightly on the mossy, resilient ground. He passed the place where he had found the antlers, and thought how wrong he had been the day he had given them to Molly, and had thought that they had understood one another again. He felt suddenly that he was going along this stream for the last time. Molly had spoiled everything, and he could not even care about Goldilocks. Damn her, he said, damn her. It was only Goldilocks that had made him able to forget the tunnel. Now she had wrecked it all. It was possible even now that she was telling Winifred, but on second thoughts this seemed unlikely. She was too smart. She would save up and use it when the right time came. She was always saving up something and always had. She saved her candy at Christmas until everyone else had finished, and then a day or so later she brought all hers out and ate it in front of them and wouldn't give them a crumb of it. And she saved up all the jokes she heard and the things people had said and other people's dreams so that she had the reputation of being interesting, although no one could stand her because she was so sarcastic. She would, for instance, take the pun he had made and pretend it was her own. He sat down finally on a lichen-covered rock beside the beaver dam. One day late in October he had come here by himself not to hunt for Goldilocks, but to escape Uncle Claude, who had wanted him to go and look at the winter wheat. The day had been cold with a wind and a chill that crept along the skin, not quite penetrating. The sky was heavy and the leaves were all fallen and were all brown. The skinny trees were already gray with winter and the ferns underfoot crumbled, making a faint sound. He had seen a weasel and had thought how in just a little while its coat would turn white and it would be an ermine. At the very moment he remembered the weasel, a salamander, black and orange, streaked through the fern break beside his rock, making him think of Grandfather Bonnie's snuff box. Was there anything in the world, he wondered, that did not make you think of something else? From the snuff box he went on to the night Miss Runyon had brought the flowers, and he and Molly had sobbed silently for Grandpa on the floor beside his coffin. Nothing had ever really been right since then, but why? He perfectly saw the old man and perfectly heard him sing. Oh, we'll sit on his white house bane, and I'll pike out his bonny blue eyn. Where a lock of his garden hair will seek our nest when it blows bare. I'll never be happy again, he said softly and aloud. Neither would Molly, but Molly did not want to be happy, and she wanted him to be as wretched as she. If she told his mother, if his mother gave him a moral lecture, often using the expression, not quite nice, he would leave home. He would not just threaten, he really would join the Navy. The decision made him feel better, and he got up. He moved around the beaver dam, looking alertly through the trees. Just beyond this black, silent pool, there was a little glade he knew of, with a flat rock in the center of it, like a table. He thought he heard someone across the dam and stopped to listen, but he concluded that it had only been a bird rustling. It had occurred to him that it might be Uncle Claude, but he realized that he could not have caught, got back from the stud farm so soon. Quiet as it was, there was, as always in the forest, a feeling of life nearby, and when, softly moving aside a branch of choke cherry, he saw Goldilocks in the glade beside the flat rock feeding on a jackrabbit, he was not surprised. He had been certain this last moment that he would find her there. She delicately moved the rabbit with her paw and then savagely ripped it with her teeth. He stood holding his breath, utterly motionless for a minute, debating but he could not hold out against the temptation. Uncle Claude would have to forgive him. If he didn't, Ralph would go away. As he raised his rifle, he heard another sound, but this time from the direction of the face of the mountain. Goldilocks heard it too and lifted her heavy head. Before she could find him with her topaz eyes, he shot, and immediately he was stone blind. His blindness lasted for an exploded moment, and when he was able to see again, to see the tumbled yellow body on the bright grass, he realized that he had not been blind but deaf, for there had been another gun, another shot, a split second after his. Uncle Claude came charging through the brush, hollering like an Indian, By God, we done it. By Jesus Christ, we both done it. And he ran to the lion, throwing his gun on the ground. 
She had fallen toward Ralph on her wounded side, and no blood was visible. Uncle Claude turned her over to look for the wounds, and Ralph stepped forward. She's so little, said Ralph softly, as if Goldilocks were not dead, but only asleep. Why, she isn't any bigger than a dog. She isn't as big. But what mattered was whose bullet had killed her. They looked together eagerly, pushing back the hair with their hands. Ralph was surprised to find how short and harsh it was. There was only one bullet hole, and it was not in the place where Ralph had aimed. He was sick with failure, sick and furious with his uncle for coming so quietly and winning so easily. Uncle Claude said, No man alive can judge which one of us got her. I reckon we'll have to call it a corporation. There was a sound in the chokecherry bushes beyond them, opposite where Ralph had stood to shoot. It was a sound that could come only from a human throat. It was a bubbling of blood. Uncle Claude and Ralph stood up and looked at one another in an agony of terror, and for a moment they could not move but stood hatless, the sun blazing down upon them and upon the lion at their feet. Somebody... Uncle Claude, bending almost in two at the waist, ran across the clearing, and Ralph followed, his body a flame of pain. Molly lay beside a rotten log, a wound like a burst fruit in her forehead. Her glasses lay in fragments on her cheeks, and the frame, torn from one ear, stuck up at a raffish angle. The elastic had come out of one leg of her gym bloomers, and it hung down to her shin. The sound in her throat stopped. Uncle Claude knelt down beside her, but Ralph stood some paces away. He could as clearly see the life leave her as you could see fire leave burned out wood. It receded like a tide, lifted like a fog. When Uncle Claude stood up, Ralph began to scream. He threw back his head, and with his mouth as wide as it would open, he let the sound flow out of him, burning up the mountains. Then he was too hoarse to scream any longer, and he threw himself down on the ground and pounded the pine needles with his fists and with his feet moaning. I didn't see her. I didn't hear her. I didn't kill her. Uncle Claude came to him and seized him by the shoulder roughly and made him stand up. Cut it out, he said sharply. Get the hell out of here and go get somebody. He stood with his arms hanging at his sides and said, I didn't know she was there. God damn it, I know that. Shove now. Go on. Get somebody. In a minute, he thought, just let me have a minute. He knelt down beside his sister and touched the blood on her forehead, stroked her cheeks, felt of her sodden hair. Molly, he said, Molly girl. He kissed her blood salty lips as if like a dog he could lick her wound and heal it. Uncle Claude kicked him in the ribs and said, when I sh say shove, I mean shove. He had to go then. He stumbled across the clearing trying not to look at Goldilocks. At the head of the beaver dam, he saw Winifred running toward him and knew that she had heard his screams. He stopped and waited for her, sitting again on the rock where he had seen the salamander. He pulled from its sheath a stalk of upland bearded barley and bit its succulent stem and chewed. There was neither a past nor a future to his life in this single yellow minute. When she came panting up, he said, Go on through the clearing. They're on the other side, and though her face questioned him, she ran on without a word. For a long time, he sat there muttering like a crazy man, Molly, 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 Molly. He said it until they came back, Winifred carrying the guns and Uncle Claude carrying his dead sister with her ruined head. They had tied a handkerchief around her forehead so that you could not see the hole, but the blood had soaked through. Relaxed like that in Uncle Claude's arms, she looked like a tall, slim monkey. By the time they got her down to the car, the sun was setting. Directly, Ralph thought there would be that evil, yellow light. Uncle Claude and Winifred sat in the front, and Ralph sat in the back besides Molly, whom they had propped up like a person. He looked straight ahead, watching the road being devoured by the car like an endless red noodle. Magdalene was in the front yard picking mint, and Uncle Claude called to her to come and help. She came to the car and looked in at Molly. There was no emotion at all on her pleated black face. But as soon as she spoke, Ralph was able to collapse. She said, Lord Jesus, the poor little old piece of white trash. <laughs>